Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, AI-Driven Interoperative CT Imaging, Democratizing Real-Time Interoperative Image Guidance for Peripheral Bronchoscopy. This webinar is sponsored by Body Vision Medical. We want to thank them for their continued support and being 2023 SAB sponsors. Before we begin, just a few reminders if you are new to the SAB webinars. You all have joined in a listen-only mode. You may submit any questions you have by using your question feature that is located on your control panel. We will address all questions at the end of the lecture. At this time, I will hand it off to Dr. Matuzak to get us started. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone, the SAB, for putting this webinar together. Thanks to Body Vision for sponsoring it, and thanks to all of the attendees for taking time out of your day. Hopefully, uh, after this hour, you'll feel it was an hour well spent, and you gained a little bit of knowledge on AI-driven intraop CT imaging. Uh, as mentioned, if you've got questions, throw them in the chat box. We'll try and hit them all at the end, uh, but we'll try and keep them to the end just to make the flow a little bit easier. I'm Mike Machuzak. I work at the Cleveland Clinic. And we got Sean Stoy, who's going to be up next. Uh, I'll give a little intro, and then we'll get rolling with him. And uh, I will follow him up and hopefully uh, do him justice, because I know he's going to put on a great presentation. So just a little bit about Dr. Stoy. Uh, he's an interventional pulmonologist at the Respiratory Consultants in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. It's near the Twin Cities. He completed medical school at the University of North Dakota, followed by a residency in internal medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center, uh, which is in Minneapolis as well. After completing a fellowship in pulmonary critical care at Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, he pursued a second fellowship in interventional pulmonary at the University of Chicago and trained with a lot of great folks there as well. After his fellowship, he joined a private practice group with pulmonary critical care at a level one trauma center. They serve the most diverse neighborhoods in Minnesota, and he tells us he enjoys the challenge of balancing both the critical care practice with the diagnostic and therapeutic interventional pulmonary practice. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sean. Uh, I will mute myself so that uh, I can cloud up any of your images. Sean, take it away. Thank you, Mike. So, uh, as Mike said, I'm uh, one of the interventional pulmonologists in Minneapolis, and um, I'm privileged to speak with everybody here and talk to you a little bit more about uh, the challenges and, and, and hopefully some solutions in navigational bronchoscopy and real-time interoperative imaging. Um, just a brief conflicts of interest, uh, not too many. I uh, do uh, work with Body Vision Medical um, in the Lung Vision Education Platform and Teaching. And uh, I also am a consultant and a speaker for Biodesix. So uh, a few preemptive slides, um, things that we all know, um, as uh, I was telling Mike, as, as, as Kyle Hogarth says, we suck at lung cancer. Uh, we continue to, as much as it, we've had advances in lung cancer, um, lung cancer is the still leading cause of death in the U.S., um, more than colon, breast, and prostate cancers combined, 2.2 million new lung cancer cases diagnosed annually. And despite all of the technological improvements and all of our silicon cessation, lung cancer screening, their survival rates are pretty dismal, 20% uh, um, in the U.S., uh, which is twice as good as it is world, worldwide. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, as we know, uh, the sooner you diagnose lung cancer, the better your outcome. Uh, and yet only 16% of lung cancers are diagnosed at stage one when you have the best chance of surviving more than five years, uh, whereas 65% of cancers, lung cancers are diagnosed at stages three to four, and now we're talking about less than 10% chance of survival at five years. Uh, more than half of the people with lung cancer die within a year of being diagnosed. We, we can definitely improve on this, and, and we know that. Uh, the challenges in diagnosing lung cancer uh, using our, you know, current and past and, uh, and, and uh, medical technologies, one of the biggest things that we relied on um, uh, and continue to rely on is a preoperative uh, CAT scan to tell us where we're going to, to derive a basically a virtual target. And all of the uh, navigation platforms, aside from some that we'll talk about, um, including ENB and robotics, rely on that scan. And the problem is, you can get divergence, and the other problem is you don't have any way to track once you're there that you're actually biopsying the nodule and not a virtual target. If you can't confirm that your tool is inside of the target, right, how are you going to even begin to say that the target is in your tool? And this has been shown 
um, and quantified on studies showing the difference between a preoperative CT and an intraoperative cone beam CT, which showed that on average, a lung nodule from a pre-op CT to intraoperative uh, post-anesthesia with uh, atelectasis and everything, the nodule itself that you're going after uh, on average moves 15 millimeters. And when you're talking about a 15 millimeter lung nodule, that's the entire nodule not even being in the place that your target is, is, is being marked on your screen. And this is even more important as they showed <clears throat> intraoperatively when they're actually confirming where their tools are going uh, with a cone beam CT uh, or tomosynthesis based CT that, or uh, a C-arm, that 31% of nodules don't have any overlap of where they were virtually laid out on the screen preoperatively and uh, compared to intraoperatively. So 32% of the time, if you're navigating out to the target that's marked without any other uh, confirmation to show where your tools are going, 32% of the time you're literally biopsying a virtual target. If they corrected for it with tomosynthesis, uh, they were able to achieve a 95% overlap. So only 5% of the time were they not able to overlap the lesion with where the target really was. And this is also shown that despite the influx of all sorts of new technologies, uh, advanced ENBs, robotic bronchoscopies, still the published literature, we're really not able to crack an 80% yield, diagnostic yield in bronchoscopy uh, on all these platforms that rely on a preoperative CT and don't have the benefit of an intraoperative conformational uh, imaging strategy. And why that's really important is, you know, we are always trying to compare ourselves to CT guided biopsies. We want to say that we can be as good. We know that we can have less complications. We know that we can also do a lot more during the bronchoscopy, whether or not it is or is not cancer, including nodal staging, including <clears throat> looking for other reasons that the that the nodule could be there if it's not cancer, like doing our BALs and all that. We all know that the guidelines say that we should be doing the least number of procedures possible, but for this time, we also know that when we miss, we rely on a radiologist to actually get there. And why is it that they can get there 92% of the time? It's because they have real-time imaging guiding where they're going, confirming that they're in the lesion, being able to guide their needle and guide their passes until they can get, again, 92% of the time, they can get an accurate diagnostic yield. The real-time imaging eliminates that CT to body image diversion. It eliminates the movement of the nodule after the patient has laid on the table for a while. It also enables, again, it enables the confirmation that your tool is inside the nodule as you're biopsying. All of those things are what is really the, you know, the pinnacle of allowing us to get an accurate diagnosis. So what can we do about things like that? Well, there are some existing interoperative imaging solutions. Uh, there are fixed cone beam CTs, and there are also 2D 3-arm C-arms that are available. Those are solutions. They've been shown to be helpful. Um, some of the problems are upfront, they're extremely expensive. Fixed cone beam CTs are in the million-plus range. The 2D, 3D C-arms are in the $500,000 range. In addition to that, these, these imaging platforms have additional radiation exposure compared to just a C-arm. Uh, concerns of overrating your patients, but really overrating, or, overrating ourselves and especially our staff uh, who are exposed to extra radiation. Um, also, when you buy a system like a fixed cone beam CT or a 2D or 3D C arm, these aren't necessarily, depending on your institution, going to be dedicated to a pulmonary space. There's a lot of demand for other proceduralists, spine surgeons, um, orthopedics, et cetera, who can use these and find out that they're available um, interventional radiology that you might find yourself struggling to get block time or any time on these once they're in the institution. It's reliant on a single piece of imaging equipment. It's either that or nothing. There's not uh, overlap with other op options of imaging in the facility. It's this or nothing. And despite them having improved imaging quality, you're still not having what we call augmented fluoroscopy, meaning that as you're navigating to 
the lesion as you're actually biopsying the lesion, they're not truly confirming that you're in the lesion with any sort of real-time imaging guidance. With all this in mind, there is a lot of things that we are trying to do within healthcare to improve our populations. We want, to, we want to improve the individual patient experience. We want to improve the health of populations. We want to ex, uh, improve the experience of our, ourselves as healthcare professionals. We want to reduce the cost of care, and we want to reduce health inequities. And two things that are obviously very important, um, both administratively and, uh, and within our communities, is making sure that we have uh, health equity, that we have equal access to these platforms, regardless of which institution that you're going to and that we do it in a cost-effective way. Uh, so in comes Lung Vision by Body Vision Medical. It's a AI-driven interoperative CT imaging. It delivers cone beam quality images, but it uses any C-arm that you have in the hospital. Um, it works with literally any platform, and I can speak to that a little later because we have some odd imaging platforms at our institution. Um, and what it allows you to do is it eliminates that CT to body divergence we talked about and it improves the yield by actually allowing you to visualize your tool in the lesion. And at the same time, it allows a, a augmented fluoroscopy to guide you to the lesion, replacing your, uh, repl in, in some cases, it can replace your need for any sort of electromagnetic navigation. Again, this is not relying on any sort of electromagnetic navigation solution and you're using instead image-guided navigation. It can be a standalone solution. I use it as a standalone solution. In addition to that, it plays well with others. If you happen to have a robotic uh, bronchoscope, congratulations, um, <clears throat> I'm jealous, but uh, if you have one, you can also use it to enhance your yields, to enhance your navigation within those platforms. How does it work? Uh, again, it's an AI-driven, uh, interoperative CT imaging. It's proprietary. They're not going to tell me exactly how it works, but with any C-arm, it takes a whole series of uh, 2D images across the entire arc of the C-arm, and it's able to then, uh, with computational analysis, derive a 3D image um, of the anatomy inside of the lung. The, the images are then displayed in different interactive views. You get an interoperative 3D scan, which, uh, which looks very much like a CT uh, image. You also get an interactive 3D view of your, that eliminates some of the other structures to see just your tool and the lesion that you've outlined uh, preoperatively of your target. And while you're navigating uh, under 2D imaging, it gives you a augmented target where you've highlighted your lesion regardless of its density. And you can see it in any, um, any fluoroscopy view, regardless of angle, it will move with you. The system itself is also very uh, space conscious. Uh, if you have a bronchoscopy room like mine, space is of, of very much importance. Uh, the body vision main unit is portable. It can be put anywhere in the room. It's wireless. There are, there are literally no wires attached to anything, any of your other equipment. There is uh, the main unit, and then there's the tablet, which can be put on a stand. You can also take it off of the stand. It's, again, wireless. And then there is a positioning board, which anybody who's used ENB, it looks similar to it, but again, there are no wires attached to it. It's a board that has, that has radio opaque targets in there to help them with their AI-driven um, algorithms. Um, and again, that can be used on any table that allows for fluoroscopy, and it can be used with any C-arm. Um, speaking to it being a standalone platform, they have a procedural kit. So you, again, you don't have to uh, piggyback. You don't have to piggyback up of any other platform. You can use your current bronchoscopes with anyone with a 2.8 millimeter working channel um, and, any, and any biopsy tools up to a 1.9 millimeters. Uh, they have two different pre-curved catheters, a 90 degree and a 210 degree. If you're familiar with the other EMB platforms, these catheters work very much similarly to any other um, extended working channel that you've used, except that they've thought about the difficulties in localizing the tip of your uh, extended working channel, and they put radiopaque markers in there to help for you to see where the end of your catheter is to know where your tools will be coming out um, under fluoroscopy, which has been very useful. 
Uh, just a little word on the setup again, basically showing that this is a low impact in terms of your uh, utilizing space in your bronchoscopy room. Um, when you're having your bronch and your and your radial ebus and your C arm, and depending on which kind of table the patients are on, having less in the room is more. Add to it a, bronch, a robotic bronchoscope. All these things take up space. The body vision platform does not take up any more space. Um, aside from a tablet, essentially, because again, the, the mobile cart can be anywhere in the corner of the room. And again, as we talked about, use whatever equipment you want with it. They have their standalone kit. If you have any other equipment, it plays well with any of the um, other tools, um, and it's compatible with all of the C-arms that you can imagine, including at my institution, I don't know if anybody uses one because uh, this was GI driven, but there's some uh, C-arm platform called Omega. Uh, I think we're one of a very small handful of institutions that uses it. Um, and within a single phone call to the company, and I said, we got an Omega system. They said, we can work with it. And, with, and it, was, it was seamless. Um, I, again, I, I've never heard of Omega. I don't know why they call an imaging company Omega. It's the last thing I think of, and that's probably why they named it Omega. But uh, it was it was very simple. There was there was nothing more than them saying, "Okay, um, does it make an image?" And I said yes, and they said we can work with it. Um, what this uh, platform has allowed me to do, we you know we were using uh, first or not first generation, but we we were using Super Dimension. Um, but because of the frustration that we had with them. Uh, we approached our our institution about getting an augmented fluoroscopy platform and it was it was also very easy because my institution i mean again unlike maybe others but my institution is very cost conscious and this was a very cost effective way for us to build out uh and and increase our both our yields and our abilities to see more and and do more for our patients um it's yeah, it's been a game changer for our institution. We have completely designed our program around it um, and uh, ha have buy-in from our oncologists and our thoracic surgeons, understanding that our yields are um, are as good as any, any other platform um, available. Um, again, comparing technologies. So uh, you have Body Vision, you have Medtronic with their Illumisite, you have the Monarch robot, you have NOAA, uh, which I'm sure all of us have gotten emails about. Uh, you have ION, and then you have non-navigational platforms of 2D, 3D C arms and a fixed cone, cone beam CT. Um, within these, uh, they, they're all very good platforms. Um, the Body Vision gives you the combination of both navigation as well as C arm based tomography. Uh, it's the only platform that does both. Uh, Med, Med Tronic Illumisite gives you digital tomosynthesis, but it does not give you real-time fluoroscopic overlays, uh, and it does not allow for tool and lesion reanalysis. It simply uses that to adjust the position of the nodule. Um, again, the majority of the other uh, navigational platforms are electromagnetic-based, so you don't have to worry about any electromagnetic uh, interference uh, on the patient with an image guiding uh, guided approach. Uh, and again, the cost of the platform is substantially less. The capital cost is less, the service cost is less, and the cost per case is substantially less. Um, if you use the kit, the kit's less than $1,000. If you don't use the kit, the cost per case goes down to zero. Um, so it's a very cost effective and accurate system that has again um, been a uh, uh, main main player in me being able to build my uh, nodule program at a community hospital. Uh, a little bit redundant, but it, it again it works well with uh, robotic or other platforms. Uh, I don't have the experience with that. Dr. Machuzak will be able to talk to more about using it with the robot. I use it as a standalone solution and our diagnostic yields are, um, are very, very good. And as an example of that, here's a case. Um, this is a 65-year-old woman. She's a never smoker. She's a retired oncology nurse. She has a history of MS. She got an MRI spine uh, to uh, continue to follow her MS, and they happened to find a lung nodule. 
had a follow-up CT scan that showed two nodules. One was a 1.2 centimeter pleural-based uh, density in the uh, right middle lobe, and the other one was a 1.5 um, part solid, part GGO in the uh, left upper lobe. She's referred to me, saw her, asymptomatic, super worried. Here's her CT imaging. Um, so we see the pleural-based 12 millimeter nodule out in the right middle lobe. We see the part solid, part GGO nodule in the left upper lobe, um, both of which have some concerning features. Uh, but based on her history, we decided to get a PET scan. The PET scan showed petavidity um, on both nodules. So equally concerning. And again, now we have two nodules. Uh, they could be cancer, they don't have to be cancer. We decided to use a nut lung nodule serologic test, um, which happened to actually up-classify her risk to being even higher risk. So it's based on there being antibodies to mutational markers in the cancer pathways found in her, ser in her serum. And so her pretest probability of, pre of cancer went up even farther, uh, and yet we still have two nodules, and we don't know which one is cancer, which one's not cancer, if either are cancer. And so we scheduled it for bronchoscopy with lung vision. We're able to navigate to both nodules, and we got a full EBUS of their entire lymph node stations. Uh, the left upper lobe lesion was confirmed as a concentric location um, on, on the location on fluoroscopy. Uh, unfortunately, in rows, we got bronchial epithelial cells. We still took more biopsies, and I dropped a fiducial marker uh, in that location. Um, we then changed the target, which is very quick to do. Um, re did a, a quick spin to localize the lesion, uh, went to the right middle lobe lesion. We got an eccentric localization uh, adjusted, um, and rows showed bronchial epithelial cells. Dropped another fiducial marker um, and completed the EBA staging as as performed. Here is the here is the uh, uh, registration portion of this, just showing how the workflow works. Highlight the uh, find the lesion in the uh, in tomography version of it. Um, localize it, which uh, if you use the AI tomosynthesis, you can also look at it in CT view. Here's the, here's the actual fluoro images that we saw during the case showing our uh, extended working channel, showing our, um, showing our biopsying of the nodule, uh, showing us uh, being within the nodule on the augmented fluoro, which is the yellow highlighted area, and me dropping a fiducial within the target lesion. And here's the second part of the case, finding the nodule on the imaging platform, confirming that it's that it looks similar on the tomography. Uh, again, getting biopsies and uh, adjusting position to get more biopsies of the nodule under real-time fluoro, augmented fluoro guidance. We actually did a spin to confirm tool and lesion, which you're seeing here, uh, the tip of the tip of the um, extended working channel being shown to be directly inside of the lesion of interest. And here's the 3D view again showing the last marker on the tooltip being directly next to the lesion, showing that we were in the correct position. Getting more biopsies and then dropping a fiducial. I'll skip through that. Um, the pathology came back in the left upper lobe. Uh, the aspirates and biopsies showed chronic inflammation, fibrosis, negative for malignancy. Um, the BAL, uh, negative for malignancy or anything else. The right middle lobe biopsy showed chronic inflammation and fibrosis, negative for malignancy, and all of her lymph node stations were also negative. Um, on follow-up, uh, again, because although chronic inflammation and fibrosis seemed like very good, news for her we discussed and because of her serologic testing we decided we need more confirmation and so we did end up having her undergo in addition to that a ct guided biopsy um, both of which were performed um, i highlight these images because you can see both here and in the right middle lobe and the left upper lobe you can see the placement of my fiducial marker demonstrating that i was actually you know again, inside of the lesion as I was biopsying it. Um, they also biopsied it from the outside, and lo and behold, they got chronic inflammation and fibrosis. 
So confirmation that we got the actual biopsy, uh, I would say, I would argue that had we done it in the reverse approach and they had gotten chronic inflammation and fibrosis from a CT guided biopsy, we still with those blood tests would have gone and said, we, we need to try a bronchoscopic approach to give double confirmation. Um, so two lesions, complete staging, and this person walks away without cancer. Extremely good news for her. She has ongoing surveillance. Um, she has no symptoms. And with the blood testing, we've advised her to stay up to date on all of her other cancer screening. So in brief summary, um, it was a difficult situation given the, the PET scan and the uh, blood testing. The use of the lung vision allowed us to do both nodules at the same time, get a full staging, get fiducials placed, and the case length took less than 60 minutes. And I'll pass this over to Mike. All right, thank you, Sean. That was fantastic. Uh, so we'll have my slides coming up in just a second. Folks able to see them? Yep, we can see them. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk uh, about lung vision real time uh, and, and lay in some publications that are out there, but also some of our experiences uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, conflicts of interest. I do some educational work with Olympus. I'm on the medical advisory board for Surpex, and I don't know what's going to happen with this talk. So. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, I'm going to talk about lung vision, and I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but I'm going to talk about a lot of the positives here because this is something that after using it, I, I really do believe in. Uh, a little bit about our history. We have 11 interventional pulmonologists that work on main campus, uh, and then four or five advanced diagnostic bronchoscopists as well. I was educated that there's actually five folks that are using lung vision with pretty regularity. Uh, and we've been using it since the first generation system in 2019 and the second generation system since 21. Uh, on average, we've done around 80 uh, using lung vision as either a standalone modality, more so in the beginning, uh, and then more recently in combination with, unfortunately, an embarrassment of riches. We have both a, a monarch and an ion, so it's been used in both robots. And a little bit to show how much we believe in this, Joe Sassinia, who does some of his off-main campus work at Fairview, uh, just got a second system uh, for that hospital as well. And speaking of Joe, uh, he put together a really nice multi-center trial. This was the first multi-center trial, first real publication looking at this. This was the first generation uh, of lung vision. Five centers got together, about 55 patients. The median size is about two centimeters, which is an average size for nodules that come through the door but there was a pretty wide range, anywhere from five millimeters all the way up to eight centimeters. But what they did was using radial EBUS as the confirmation of did I get where I wanted to be, 93% of the time they had localization success. Now the index day of procedure answer, so this is a rapid onsite while you're in the room, getting an answer was over 75%. And this is quite good uh, and he didn't we didn't follow these patients up long term. This is mostly to get an answer, get some publication out there, talk about this uh, technology. Uh, as you can see, there was a wide range of nodules, not atypical for lung cancer, more so in the upper lobes, uh, and the range varied. With the exception of this two to three centimeter size makes sense. As the nodule size got bigger, the diagnostic yield also got better, uh, and it was a pretty Pretty good mix of nodules across the board. Uh, Mike Pritchard uh, put together the next study. This was 51 patients. This is a single center uh, study. 1.8 centimeters in size, so pretty similar in size with a tighter range, seven millimeters up to about five centimeters. Now, he did something different. He used a fixed cone beam to show that he was where he claimed to be according to the navigation with lung vision. And 96% of the time, he was where he thought he was according to the target. Uh, his day of procedure, index day diagnosis was 78%. But he was able to follow these patients for a full year uh, and that yield increased to 88.2% because some of the benign, the non-specific benign diagnoses were later shown to be benign in follow-up with CT scans or further biopsies. Uh, but a, an 88.2% yield uh, 
in that one year follow up, which is, which is I think we'd all agree is pretty fantastic. Again, more in the upper than in the lower, and the nodule range was kind of split. 60% um, were smaller than two, and 40% were larger than two. Now, we talked a little bit about some of this, but some of the other aspects of body vision that users have really found useful is even though it's a newer technology, it still didn't add to the procedure time. Procedure time in general was about 50 minutes across the board in, in a couple of these trials. The radiation dose that you use or that you are exposed to here is significantly less than what it would be in a fixed beam, C, uh, in a fixed cone beam CT scan, right? Whenever you're doing a cone beam, everybody leaves the room because there's a big dose of radiation that's coming around. That's not the case here. And remember, we said this before, we'll say it again, this is a C-arm that we're spinning. So you're even getting less radiation that you would have, say, in the 3D SIOS uh, from Siemens, for example. But uh, one-sixth, one-fifth of the dose of what you would get for one of those scans you're getting when you're using this, this system. You can use this independently, or it could be combined with other technologies. And as far as I know, they haven't found a C-arm that uh, it does not mesh with so far. And you can use this in your bronchoscopy suite as opposed to having it go down to IR for a fixed cone beam. And, and this is like everything uh, in the last uh, several months is using artificial intelligence. But what's really nice about this is they fed in tons and tons of data into the system. And this system has been upgraded multiple times. The hardware has been the same, but the software has been updated. And each time they update it, because of the AI and the machine learning, it gets better and better. It's better at identifying what a blood vessel is. It's better at identifying what the nodule looks like, the contour of the nodule, the definition, the delineation of nodule to lung parenchyma, and also identifying the tools. And the more that this is used, the more benefit we all get because of this learning algorithm. And as you'll see some of these images later, the images are really fantastic and comparable to what you get from an actual diagnostic CT scan, even though you're just using a C-arm that we've all got laying around the hospital. Uh, and you know, everything is AI nowadays, right? They've even come up with an artificially intelligent Oreo. Yeah, it's, it's one smart cookie. Uh, so now moving on to uh, the evolution of lung vision intraoperatively. So in the beginning, this was a scan where we get our tomal synthesis at an REO of 45 to an LAO of 45. And that gave us a good image. It gave us LAO, it gave us a coronal, it gave us an REO. Uh, and then with some work, we were able to get some, some 3D view. Now for the past year, year and a half, we're doing a 180 spin. And that gives us everything we would get with the standard traditional CAT scan. And you'll see the images and, and how they compare. So these are a couple nine millimeter nodules from actual cases. And what you see here on this side of the screen, this is the CAT scan. This is the diagnostic CAT scan, the fixed CAT scan. And compare this image to what you're getting from just the plain old C-arm spin. This is a 180 degree manual spin with your C-arm. Again, the same C-arm that you've got laying all, all around the hospital. And, and these images really look fantastic. Same thing over here. Really good images just from that C-arm. Uh, a, a plural based nine millimeter one, <clears throat> and then over here a 10 millimeter one. Now we've seen a couple of these that are solid, but what about those that are part solid or even a ground glass? Well, even on those, we've got a really good definition. This one is a central cavity. You can't see it so well because the marking sits right through it. But even on that, these two images are pretty darn close together. And again, this is just from a plain old C-arm. Over here, a pure ground glass one. And again, the diagnostic CT scan that our radiologists read every day compared to what we see and what we can get in the Bronx suite. And I think everybody would agree these images are pretty good. Not only that, you've got it in the sagittal and you've got it in the axial. Uh, so we're, we've all been pretty happy with what the newest version can do. There isn't a lot of data that exists out there. Uh, and the University of Chicago was able to put together something using this next generation. They did 45 navigations, again, with an average range of around 17 millimeters in the nodule, and, and a, a tighter range again, four millimeters down to three and a half centimeters. What they found was a 91.9% diagnostic yield. So that's good. Now, there's a lot of talk in any meeting you go to 
you'll hear someone talk about what is a true definition of a diagnostic yield. Now, they did this in combination with the Monarch robot. And so to sort of keep things in line, what they used was the benefit trial. The benefit trial was the first multi-center trial with the Monarch looking at yield. The, the primary was um, rebus confirmation, but they also looked at what the actual diagnostic yield was, and it was around 74% in that study in benefit. Um, so you have EBUS confirmation, or what more and more people are really going to is tool in lesion confirmation, and that's what you can get with this system. We'll break down what they had. So the 45 biopsies, right off the bat, 32 of them were malignant. So there's no question about those. And then they had 10 that had a benign histology. Now, if we use the strict definition and the immediate same day yield, there were six specific benign diagnoses. That gives it an 84.4%. Still better than what we've seen so far in, in majority of the trials coming through with the exception of an isolated cone beam trial. Uh, if you use the intermediate definition, this is the one that was similar to what was done in the benefit. But that included these three additional cases. So two were nonspecific benign inflammations that on follow-up supported they were benign. And then one additional one went on for a surgical biopsy, which confirmed scar. So there were a few that were lost to follow up, but only one that was proven that was missed uh, in, in this group. Again, this is a combination of the robot, Monarch in this case, with lung vision. And as we see, multi single center studies were getting very good yields with this technology. Now, if you look at the studies over here, you can see that there's a difference. And where that difference begins to fall is when you begin to add intraoperative imaging. And if you talk with folks that have much more experience than I do with this, those that have been doing cone beam CT for a long time, the, the feeling really is, is shifting. We love to have a concentric EBUS image, but if we have got that CT scan or a tomogram that shows us we've got our tool in the lesion, that really is the best that we can do. Now we can talk about a diagnostic drop in the needle or the forceps or the brush not getting enough tissue coming back. But all we can do right now at this point is get confirmation that we have our tool in our lesion. And that's the best chance of getting sample of that lesion onto our slide. And it really is beginning to separate itself out that having some kind of intraoperative imaging really seems to be the key. And why is that? Sean mentioned earlier in a Pritchett study, it showed that CT to body divergence. And that CT to body divergence was around 15 millimeters, but, but could be much bigger. And he mentioned 32% of the time, there was no overlap with where the virtual target was and where the real lesion was. And this is an example. And again, I am a big robot fan. Uh, I, I think both have a lot to offer, and I think they will be part of our future armamentarium as we move, move forward in the battle with lung cancer. But just to show you where some of the navigation techniques fall short, this is an EM virtual target, and this is where the scope is. So according to this, we're right on it. Now, what we did in this case was take this target, add in the lung vision and tell, lung vision tell us where the target was. And this is where the virtual target was, but this is in fact where the EBUS confirmation of the lesion was guided by the lung vision. And that is because of the benefit of doing that extra spin and seeing where your tool truly is and making adjustments based on that imaging. It's the same with shape sensing systems. So this is not something that is unique to EM navigation. This is present with shape, shape sensing as well. And in this case, if you look at this ion target, it says we're right on it. But in reality, when the CT scan was done, here's our needle and here is our lesion. That's more than two centimeters away from where the target is. And if you go back to that Pritchett study, that wasn't unusual. They were seeing some really significant swings going down the wrong airway, missing the target by, by a couple. With repositioning, and then a repeat spin using lung vision, now we've got confirmation of tool in lesion. And that's what we want. I don't care what the virtual target tells me I'm at, what the computer says. I want to see, 
in real time or as close to real time as possible that my tool is in the lesion that I'm going after. And this was touched on as well, so I'll go over this quickly, but you know, one of the things about this is it truly is an agnostic system. So you can use this alone, but with the catheter, the catheter based uh, kit that comes with it, you can use this with your thin scope if you got an MP, uh, or you can use this with the Monarch robot. It plugs in very easily. Same story with the Ion robot, plugs in very easily there as well. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the workflow for how this goes. We plan our target, so we mark our target, and then there's an, air, an airway that's calculated. And that airway that is calculated, we may have to finish. But we can overlay this with our CT scan and look at the CT scan in multiple planes. And that allows us to see every potential airway that might be heading through this. So at this point, you can add in a second airway if you think you might want a different target. And then once you plan that out, you can do your virtual bonk, drive down to where you think that is. And once you're doing your navigation, you've now got this augmented virtual target that's sitting right here as you're moving your instrument into where you want it to be. And this can be with the robot, it can be with the scope. Once you've gotten to where you think you are, you can slide your EBUS probe out or you can begin taking biopsies. But if you do another spin, as you can see here, we're gonna try to find is our tool where it needs to be. And if it isn't, then we have the ability to do some repositioning. And with that repositioning can get our biopsy instrument right into that spot. And then if needed, even confirm with one more spin that we truly have tool in lesion. So although we don't necessarily have strong data that says this, those that use robots really believe that the robots offer a greater stability and articulation, particularly that fine movement at the tip of the scope. And although that's fantastic, it's still fraught with the same problems from either the EM navigation or the shape uh, sensing and in that CT to body divergence. But we're dealing with a CT scan that might have been done the morning of the procedure, might have been done the day before, might have been done as far out as three or four weeks from when we're doing the procedure. That plus the combination of patients are getting bronched, their arms are at their side, they're getting mechanical ventilation. When the CT scan was done, their arms are up over the head typically, they're taking a big breath with the breath hold. So it's not the same. But if we're able to do a spin and then confirm that we have our tool where we think it is, we're completely eliminating that CT to body divergence. And that tool and lesion confirmation prior to biopsy also gives us a little bit more confidence to go after this and maybe biopsy it with a little more of them and bigger. Uh, now, we do have the SIOS, which I think is a fantastic device. Uh, but one of the things that the SIOS, you know, the SIOS can do a spin and basically give you a low grade or a, a cone beam light, as some of us call it. Uh, so the image is good, but it's not as good as what you get in the cone beam. It also takes a lot longer to do that spin than it would with the cone beam. But when you've got the Siemens, you can also use it purely as a two-dimensional C-arm. And that's what we do in a lot of these cases. Uh, and one of the reasons is the radiation dose. The radiation dose can be five, six times less using the SIOS in that simple C-arm look. Now, we can use the SIOS, or this can go into another room and we can use one of our OECs or, or another C-arm that we have, one that we call Chernobyl. And we can get that spin with a lot less radiation than we would see with using the 3D SIOS or using a full-on fixed cone beam system. We also don't need a rad tech. So I don't have one in the Bronx suite. If I'm down in the IR suite, I do have a rad tech. But I don't know how it is for folks out there and how many of you are, are fortunate enough to be able to do cone beam. I'm lucky if I get one day in a month because our IR team is just busy. So this provides an increased level of flexibility for what we can do. I can do this in my Bronx suite, on my time, with my team. I don't have to rely on availability and the gift of a day down in Combi. And then as mentioned, this can work with any C-arm. It doesn't have to be the, the SIOS. 
Now, how do you decide? And, and there's a lot of variety, right? Whenever you talk to somebody that does peripheral bronchoscopy, there are little nuances that they all pick up on. And I think one of the nice things about having the group that I do, I've got really smart people, folks that are a lot smarter than I am and folks that really have a good understanding of peripheral bronchoscopy. Uh, and, and part of that, I learn from them. Now, we don't use a robot for every single case. And I don't think that that should be how we do it. We have to be conscious of what cost is in all of our procedures. And a $2,500 or a $3,000 expense for a single use is not something that we need to do in every case. So we look at the size, we look at the location. Do we have a bronchus sign? Is it solid or not solid? If it's a ground glass lesion or a partially solid lesion, I'm gonna be much more likely to use something where I can get intraoperative imaging to confirm I am where I wanna be. So a fixed cone beam or the lung vision with a spin, because that will tell me where I am. The ground glass doesn't show up as well on a radial EBUS. So if that's what you're using for your confirmation, you're gonna run into some disappointments in those cases. Uh, the cost, as I mentioned, is a big deal. And this can be used in any one of a number of technologies from the thin scope, which you may already have, all the way up to, to the uh, extravagance of robots. And time is also something that should come into play, right? Even if you're an experienced center that's done hundreds of robots, there is still additional time that leads to the setup, the cleaning, and the breakdown of those robots. And, and that's time that is precious for, for most of us. Uh, I'm going to look at two cases and just so everybody knows, these were two cases that were just sort of picked at random. This first one's a 64-year-old female, and the picked at random will become obvious a little later. That's a former smoker who had a nodule, and that nodule was seen on two prior CT scans. They were done six weeks apart. The patient has hypertension, end-stage renal, and is being evaluated for a possible renal transplant. There's an 18-millimeter GGO in the right lower lobe. Now, we're going to register first. So the first thing we do is register where the main carina is on the CAT scan which you see over here. And then you're gonna match that up to the same spot on, on the CABT, the C-arm-based toma, uh, tomogram. Now we mark the lesion on the actual CT scan and then mark that lesion in the same spot there. Now we've got our AI tomo. Now we've got a target to go after. Now we're gonna move our instrument out and move our radial ultrasound out and try and get an image uh, out there. If we like what we see, we can take our biopsies. If we don't like what we see, like maybe we're just on the top of it, then we do our spin. And with that spin, we get another C-arm based uh, CT. And then we can see, do I like where I am or do I want to make a small adjustment? Making a small adjustment, as you can see here, now we've got this actual confirmation that our tool is in our lesion. And this is important because now you see how that biopsy plane and that angle has changed from being up on top, more apical in that lesion, to now being right smack dab in the middle. And that is one of the things that gives us some confidence. So we use this one in conjunction with the Monarch. Uh, and we used one sixth the amount of radiation by using the Sios in the 2D mode, as opposed to using the Sios in the, in the full on 3D spin mode. The case time was reasonable at 45 minutes. Now we got acute inflammation. But what's different about this is we got acute inflammation with an image of a needle in the lesion. And talking with the transplant docs, that gave them the confidence to say, okay, well, let's continue with this workup. A renal transplant workup, as you know, takes a long time. Follow-up CT scan was done three months later and there was improvement in that nodule. Now that patient is on deck, teed up for a, a kidney transplant. The next patient, 11 millimeter right upper lobe nodule. This is a 71 year old female, was a smoker, but sometime in the past, but was significant smoking in that past as a cardiac arrhythmia, and that cardiac arrhythmia would prevent this patient from getting a surgical resection. Um, it has a history of two different kinds of cancer, a malignant melanoma and a left breast cancer as well. And as mentioned, there's an 11 millimeter lesion in the right upper lobe. So this is a typical case that we would see uh, on, a, on a pretty frequent basis. Again, we lined up the main carina, and now we're lining up the main carina on the CABT, and we're getting our AI tomo, we're going to line up our nodule as well. So this is our second spin focusing on the nodule. We line that up and now we've got our target. Now our system's going to give us what we're looking for. We may drive out and we may be able to get right on this. We may be very happy with what we see. Or when we do our spin, 
and confirm for tool and lesion, we may not like it, we may change what we're doing. And now in this case, we're trying to get a better image. We did a repeat spin. You can see we're just a little bit in front of that lesion on this case. So what we do is then pull our instrument back, make an adjustment in the direction we think we want to go, and then we can repeat the spin. And you'll see on that next spin, now we've got that metal right on that target. And that allows us to get what we want, which is diagnostic material, or what we hope will be diagnostic material. This gives an idea. This is the, the markings on the, the catheter that comes with the kit. And you can see that those markings line right up to where our lesion is. And then here we are taking our biopsies, not perfectly centered, but, but getting probably a third of that lesion in that biopsy. And what we saw on this one, again, was a lower amount of radiation because we use SIOS in the 2D mode as opposed to the 3D mode. A reasonable case time, we had to do a couple um, repositionings of this one because the airway wasn't quite lined up, but 65 minutes was the time. Uh, and we saw granulomatous inflammation with necrosis. And in this patient, we have a three-month follow-up CT scan as well that shows that nodule is stable. Now, we see some peered review publications with the first generation of lung vision. And we had diagnostic yields that were mid to high 70s on that index procedure. That's day of procedure, rapid onsite evaluation. And then one study that shows a 12-month follow-up with a diagnostic yield of 88%. The newest version has a better image quality. And that gives us that AI TOMO that gives us an image that is pretty comparable to what a, a diagnostic CT scan was. And proud to say that, that we worked with the company to develop some of this and make some improvements. Uh, we now have our first published outcome of lung vision with the AI TOMO, so this is second generation, used in conjunction with the robot. In that study, it was a monarch, with the diagnostic yield of slightly over 91%. And that's in line with publications that are using fixed cone beam CT. Again, fixed cone beams, which are expensive, which have limited access, and which give a lot of radiation out there. So I think that the points we want to really try and make here is that tool in lesion imaging is really critical if you want to get good at peripheral bronchoscopy. And this is a reasonably priced, reliable technology that can get us that. Uh, additionally, this can be done with any C-arm. You don't have to have a very expensive 3D generating CT scan, and it doesn't have to be used with a fixed cone beam. Um, that's where my presentation ends. We'll tally up what kind of questions have shown up in the in the chat box. Hopefully, some have. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there are questions. We're happy to answer them. If folks want to talk with me separately, I included my email address there, and uh, I'll help out in any way I can. Thanks, Dr. Machusak. Thanks, Dr. Stoy. Um, we had a couple questions come through. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, and if any others come up, feel free to send them through the chat as well. Um, first question is, what's the learning curve like for lung vision? So um, I think maybe both Sean and I can comment on it. Uh, I can go first since I'm already live on the mic. Uh, the, the, the use of the catheter or the use of the technology, I think, is, is something you pick up very quickly first procedure uh, because we're used to navigating down a pathway or, or those that have done some kind of peripheral bronchoscopy are used to navigating following whether it's the pink line or the green line, whatever line it may be, or the blue line, uh, yellow line, whichever technology you're using, you're used to following that. What takes a little bit of learning is, is how you get set up to do that spin, to, to line up the main carina, then the spin to get it set. But it's very intuitive. And I can tell you as somebody that started using this in the very beginning, or, or not as early as Joe and Sonali, but in, in the early stages, it was much more onerous uh, in the first generation than it was much later. And now it's really a breeze to get it set up and, and, and get it um, to a point where someone who's a, technological idiot like myself uh, feels comfortable doing it without any support. Sean, do you have any comments? If you're talking, Bud, I think you're muted. There you go. I think I think the learning curve from the actual um, registration perspective, uh, we actually have rad techs, in fact, and, and I, think, I think it's some sort of, well, at least we've been told that it's either a law in Minnesota or it's an institutional thing 
We have to have a rad tech on every case that uses fluoro. Um, so we have rad techs uh, and th they have to be involved with, with moving the C-arm, uh, which is a good and a bad thing, uh, except when you have to train every single one of them up. So the learning curve on just sort of that aspect of it, the carinal spin, the nodule spin, the breath hold, uh, from the you know ancillary staff perspective takes time. They've all grasped it and, and that that's not an, an issue at all. I think that the navigational aspect, <clears throat> depending on how much, and let's be fair, how much super dimension navigational experience you have, there's a few things you need to start to forget, which is you know the way that you're navigating with the platform is with augmented fluoro as opposed to uh, a pathway that you're trying to follow uh, in a different in a different perspective, and if you're really used to super dimension, uh, it can take a while to forget some of those navigational avenues. Um, and and the other part that I really think that body vision does is it it reinforces your bronchoscopy skills. Um, and I think that the virtual uh, part of component of it, where you you know it really helps you to target the proper sub or sub sub segmental airway to you know get yourself onto the towards the right path and then know that you're going the right direction has been useful. And you're still dealing with a little bit of CT to body divergence from your first spin to your second. So sometimes the pathways does not look perfect. The target is usually right, but sometimes I feel like the pathway is a little wrong. And trying to trying to remember to like focus your target on on uh, or f focus your uh, perspective on your augmented floor. Get close, do a spin. The target will readjust. But I, you know, those have been two parts that I've, you know, been like I have to be off. I have to be off the wrong pathway because I'm not quite aligned with the pathway of the target. I don't know if you've had that experience before, but I know that I'm getting to the target. I'm getting close to the target. I need to ignore the pathway, and I think the pathway itself has really been ingrained in our minds from prior EMB. Uh, navigational platforms. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, yeah, I don't pay a lot of attention to the pathway. I, I focus on where that target is. One of the things that that I think helps for folks that are just starting to use this technology is take advantage of the RAOs and the LAOs because it's really nice about this is that that target because it's it's um, augmented imaging is is going to move. And you're going to see, am I anterior to it or am I posterior to it in the RAO, LAO? And if you look like you're on it in the AP, look like you're on it in the RAO and the LAO, you're on it, right? Because that's telling you you've now, you know, transfixed this, this lesion in that three-dimensional space. And then the ability to do a spin is really nice. One of the analogies that I, that I think about when I'm looking at it this way is it helped me get a better understanding. I remember, uh, this is back when you saw that picture of that guy from 2006 that was impersonating me on the uh, on the original slide. But when I first started doing EBUS, it, it gave me a much better understanding of anatomy, where the blood vessels truly ran, where the lymph nodes actually sit, and, and the intersection of those. And I think that this has helped in that three-dimensional idea of, of where the airways go and how I need to configure not just where, I'm, where my catheter sits, but more importantly, the trajectory of that catheter. Uh, and, and using the RAO LEO or, or that full on spin, I think is, is something that we don't do a lot um, in our training unless you've got specific um, trainees, trainers that, that have worked with you. Uh, and you begin to incorporate some of that as you use this technology. And I think it makes you a better peripheral bronchoscopist. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I also want to, like, you know, to, to one of your points of <clears throat> when your catheter was past the lesion kind of getting coming back to saying i don't need to have my catheter sitting directly on the lesion sometimes it's better to be a centimeter two centimeters off of it and rely on my tool and knowing that again my because you can track your tool going into the lesion and you can, there there are times that we all know you can be too close right too close can't be the right place to sometimes it's not the right place to be Thank you both. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming through the chat here now, so I know we're at time. Maybe we can answer them quickly. The first um, was around what is the fluoro time on each spin, and do we need a breath hold during those spins and biopsy? I'll just leave that to you, Mike. Uh, 
you you have that. Yeah, so, data. so the breath hold is, is something that's beneficial. We've adopted, uh, um, according to some of the more recent publications, uh, the higher uh, tidal volumes and higher peep, and then we do a breath hold with an APL of 20 um, when we're doing our spins. The spins are, are less than a minute or right around a minute, and uh, and it's you're doing a manual spin. Um, I haven't had much of an issue with uh, with the spin not registering if I tend to go a little faster, but I think in the beginning, uh, they do a pretty good job training you at what the speed should be for those spins. Um, is there another part of the question that I forgot? Or um, how was, long was, did those was spin? breath hold and how long? Yeah, so about a minute. Perfect. Um, okay, next question was um, Does the body vision system work with super dimension? There's no reason that it can't. Um, we I guess, Mike, you can answer this too. It will not interfere with body vision. If you are using a Lumisite, you can't, I don't believe that you can use both a Lumisite and body vision together. That that part would interfere. If you have non alumisite body vision, this can work in conjunction with it. It will not interfere with the, bo the body vision board. We've talked about it. I don't know if your institution ever tried to do it. Uh I don't believe we have, and I haven't used SuperD in, in quite a while. Uh, so I would wonder how the, the two boards would mesh together. Um, what I have done, I've used the SuperD catheters with this. Uh, and you know that's just one more sort of agnostic quality of, of this technology and that you can use any type of catheter, any type of scope to get out there. Um, I might want to kick that to you guys. Maybe you can reach out to whoever asked that question. And if you know a little more about the actual interactions on the on the body vision side yeah absolutely um the next question was specifically around interference with monarch um does the long vision interfere with monarch they they play very well together both monarch and ion um you know you you do your your planning up front your, your spin up front and then navigate using your robot whichever one it may be to your location and when you get close, that's when I would bring in, you know, the fluoro and, and use that to sort of fine tune where I'm going. Uh, and then if needed, do the additional spin. But there hasn't been an interference problem that I've seen or heard of. Last question that came through. Um, are there any downsides to body vision when comparing it to cone beam CT? Uh, well, cone beam CT is, is a faster spin. Um, cone beam CT does give you a better image than this does. Um, but I, I think when you look at the, the trade-offs, cost, access, amount of radiation that you're exposed to, uh, that, that's why I prefer to go this route as opposed to the cone beam. And I would also argue, um, having never, I will say, I, I, we have cone beam in my facility. Um, I've, I've never been given access to it um, so, so there are downsides to cone beam and depending where you're if you have great access to it, great the other thing cone beam does not do as we sort of talked about is unless i'm mistaken you you still don't have the the you know you can you can position your tool but if if your tool is is uh having deflection you still don't have the augmented you, you still don't have the place on your floor to say i'm in the right place while i'm biopsying and i do think that that is one one key component to body vision over um, the other platforms is that as you're actually biopsying, and if you know your tool is in in the augmented fluoro, it's it's useful. Yeah, it, it does depend on which cone beam system you have, um, and I'm getting them confused. But one of them does have an augmented target capability. Um, but again, you know, the, the the negatives of, of the access, the cost, the radiation, all and, and, and all of that. Um, yeah, I guess you're somebody who has unlimited access to cone beam. It it prob you know I I don't know that again having not speaking for myself, but it, if you have an unlimited access to cone beam, this platform may be uh, redundant. Emily, could we go back one slide there just for a sec? I just want to want to. Put a shout out for these two guys. Now, part of this is is a little bit of the proud papa in me, but AB was one of our fellows a long time ago, and uh, he has been uh, just an absolute star in the interventional pulmonary world. Um, so, 
both of these guys are fantastic. And I would encourage anyone that's here to think about signing up for this series uh, and also spreading the word to your colleagues about it because it, it's going to be both educational and enjoyable with those two in charge. Awesome. Um, well, thank you both so much, Dr. Machusek, Dr. Stoy. Really appreciate your time. Pass it back over to, to close us out for the night. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a good evening. <laughs>